Now, the reason we're talking about this here today is because about a week ago on Twitter, we had ourselves Mitch Gallo. You probably know who he is if you listen to TSN 690 Radio. He made himself a tweet that read this. Brady Kachuk and Elise Pedersen would be much too costly to attempt an offer sheet. But if I was a middle-of-the-pack team, I would definitely look into offer sheeting Jesperi Kotkaniemi. Now, that is going to be our topic here today, Jesperi Kotkaniemi and the idea of an offer sheet. That in which is an idea that nobody seems to be discussing with this kind of player, and in this video, we're just going to kind of go about why that is and why an offer sheet, in my opinion, is really something you shouldn't worry about if you're talking about Jesperi Kotkaniemi in particular and if you're a Montreal Canadiens fan in general. So let's just go over the entire offer sheet context and Jesperi Kotkaniemi and his story. So Jesperi Kotkaniemi, as we know, third overall pick 2018 NHL entry draft. A big surprise at the time for some people, but for a lot of Canadiens fans, it was a pick that they were kind of expecting because at the time they did need a center. Kind of interesting to see how things have worked out nowadays, three years into the future. But Jesperi Kotkaniemi made the NHL immediately after being drafted, had 34 points in 79 games played. That was significant because at the time, he outscored Alexander Barkov. And I mean, look, Barkov as another Finnish center taken in the top of his draft and who displays some very good two-way qualities, offensive, defensive, those in which are kind of the profiles that a lot of people had for Jesperi Kotkaniemi heading into the long-term future. It was a really good thing for a lot of Canadians fans looking at the profile. Now, Kotkaniemi's second year, though, was kind of a step back. He had 8 points, 36 games played, 4 goals in 10 games played in the bubble, though, which was, if you were watching the games, pretty effective because he would score some pretty clutch goals at the right time. 4 goals in 10 games on paper isn't amazing, but contextually, if you were watching the games, you would have seen some pretty good stuff. He had an AHL stint because his NHL play was not at the level we thought it should have been. He had 13 points, 13 games played. It's kind of funny because he was more of a goal scorer in the NHL. Six goals, two assists for eight points in 36 games in the regular season, and four goals and zero assists in the playoffs. But in the AHL, his only goal was an empty netter, and he had 12 assists in the 13 games he had there too. And so heading into 2020-2021, we had a really interesting profile because Kotkaniemi at this time frame, he's 20 years old, he's still developing, nobody thinks he has reached his prime yet, none the slightest. But the biggest question was, where was he going to go this year? Well, in 56 games played the full NHL season, Kotkaniemi on a pretty alright Habs team that was, I mean, they went to the finals, so that was good, but... In the regular season, they started off hot, they really cooled down towards the middle part, they had two really bad losing streaks, and they barely finished fourth overall in the North Division. Kotkaniemi had 20 points in 56 games played, and he was under a point per game for the Porina Sat in the Finnish Liga before the NHL season started out. In the postseason, he had 8 points in 19 games played as the Habs went to the Stanley Cup Finals. And you kind of know the story here. Kotkaniemi was scratched initially, and then he came back and he scored a goal and he did the 4 to the other guys that were also scratched as well. Kotkaniemi and the way he has developed so far as a 21-year-old 6'2-201 center is pretty much just a project at this point. We all kind of know he was third overall, and we all kind of know that the ceiling is pretty high with Kotkaniemi. But the thing about an offer sheet is that the offer sheets aren't usually ever signed for players based off of potential, or at least that's what I'm basing it off of in the previous three offer sheets we have had. The reason I say the reason three is because, come on, We've had three offer sheets in the past 10 years, so if we try to compare these offer sheets to what Kotkaniemi could potentially get if you should offer sheet this player, it is kind of interesting when you take a look at where exactly you're coming from here. Sebastian Ajo, in 2019 when he was offer sheeted by the Montreal Canadiens, was just coming off of a point-per-game 30-goal 83-point season and 12 points in 15 games in the playoffs. That is an elite NHL player, and it definitely helped out that he was 22 at the time. If you want to talk about Ryan O'Reilly, he signed an offer sheet in February of 2013. And back then, in that time frame, he was coming off a 55-point season in 81 games played. Back then, he was 21 years old. 
Then you go over to Shea Weber, who, in July of 2012, signed his offer sheet with the Philadelphia Flyers, and back in that time frame, I mean, look, Shea Weber was a 49-50 point defenseman in the NHL, the captain of the Preds, he was really good. So you see a common trend with these offer sheets right here, that the previous ones in the past 10 years, they've only been signed for very legitimate NHL talent that are already at the top of their games. Jesperi Kotkaniemi, sorry to say, 20 points, 56 games played, 8 points, 19 games in the postseason, that's good, but is that really worthy of an offer sheet based off of the standards that have been set by the previous three in the past 10 years? Oh, but Lego, just because there's an offer sheet doesn't mean the offer sheet has to be given out to a big-name player. You can sign cheap offer sheets. But the thing is, if you sign anything that is cheap, let's say $3 million for three years or whatever, sure, the compensation isn't that much, but it's so easy for Montreal to just go out there and match it. Part of the reason you even try to sign an offer sheet is because you're trying to get one up over the team you're taking the player from. The Montreal Canadiens didn't really do that when they signed the Sebastian Ajo offer sheet. Sebastian Ajo just kind of used the Montreal Canadiens to get the contract he wanted, as well as the bonuses he wanted from the Carolina Hurricanes. For Kotkaniemi, it's a little bit different. The Montreal Canadiens, they have themselves an extra $7.8 million of cap space activated with Shea Weber going on the LTIR. Sure, they have zero projected cap space right now, but that Shea Weber contract allows you to spend seven point something million dollars more over the salary cap. The cap right now is $81.5 million. The Habs currently have a cap hit of $83.7 million. So that's $2.2 million over the cap. You have Shea Weber on the LTIR as well as Paul Byron giving you an extra $11.2 million of cap spending ability. 11.2 minus 2.2, that gives you about $9 million to re-sign one player in Jesperi Kotkaniemi and maybe even go out there and get another player on top of that. So any offer sheet that would realistically be given out to Jesperi Kotkaniemi would be matched. In order to get this guy for your hockey team, to the entire point made by Mitch Gallo here on Twitter, you would need to overpay for this kind of guy. Overpay to the extent that the Canadians would be like, oh my goodness, you're signing him to a $6 million by two-year deal? Or, oh my goodness, you're signing him to a $7 million by seven-year deal? No way. You can have him if you're going to go out there and do that. And it's not like I'm hating on Kotkaniemi either. If he becomes a $7 million player by the time he's 26, 27 years old, then fantastic. I would love to see that. It's just, based off of what we've seen already, that is not guaranteed. I think that is agreeable right there, right? Just because he is supposed to be good does not mean he is guaranteed to do that, especially at this stage of his career, where he's at 20 points in 56 games played. Let's do the math. 20 divided by 56 multiplied out by 82. He was on pace for about 29, 30 points in a full 82-game season at 21 years old. Is that really worth going long and going big at this stage of his career? For Ajo, it was, because Ajo, at 21 years old, was over a point per game, and he had 30 goals, so it's completely different from what we have in Kotkaniemi today. It's why the offer sheet only really gets discussed with big-name players for big-money contracts, because there isn't really a point to sign guys who have yet to prove themselves in the same way to contracts that are cheaper and therefore a lot more matchable. Plus, the final thing here is, Kotkaniemi himself has to sign the offer sheet, which is unlikely because unless a team goes out there and shells some big, big money to him, he probably has no reason to sign because it's like, okay, well, Montreal could offer me that same $4 million by two-year contract themselves, so why would I sign with your team? What bonus do I have for signing with you instead of Montreal? So, that kind of concludes our discussion here on a Jesperi Kotkaniemi offer sheet. I, for one, do not think it's going to happen. It's one of the ones that I was not really considering at all, because Kotkaniemi isn't really in that Kachuk Pedersen status where making an offer sheet would even be worth it. So, talk to me in the comments what you think about this entire idea over here. Do you fear a KK offer sheet? I don't, but if you do, please let me know in the comments why. Furthermore, where do you think Kakagemi's next contract lies? What do you think he's going to get? How long? Is it a bridge deal? Is it long term? Do they try to lock him up and say, okay, we'll give you eight years, but we'll give you five million dollars? So if you do become the next Barkov, then you will be a big steal of a contract, like a dry sidle or a McKinnon kind of contract right there. There are options here. So let me know in the comments what you think of you enjoyed this video. And bye. <laughs>